after time, time after time, time after time. Whoa, hey, hold on. Getting ready for the closing couple chapters. Got to get myself back in. <clears throat> Got to get my tie back up. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, John O'Keefe, present and accounted for. It is so good to see you. It is so good to be present. It is so good to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been on the adventure of Gregor the Overlander for the last period of time, man. It's been a little bit of an exceptional uh, period. We've had some changes. We've had some adventures here at the house. We've had some opportunities to take breaks, but I hope, hope, hope beyond hope that you have always had a book right next to you that you've been able to fill in. But now we are here. We are at the point. Gregor, dad, boots, rip reds off, kind of gave a little salute. We've got Luxa crying in Vicus's arms. We are at a point of time in which we must figure out what the resolution of this story is. It's a little bit blustery out, so please forgive my hair for finding its uncontrollable nature. But uh, I promise that that will not get in the way of us. Keep your eyeballs out for some of the uh, beautiful birds that might come and choose to listen to the story right back there. Um, and uh, let's get into this. So resolution. Before we dig in, what is the resolution of a story? Well, to resolve means to end, to come to completion. It is the part of a narrative. It is the part of a story where you've got the beginning, where you're introduced to all your characters, you're introduced to the setting, you're introduced to the situation at hand. Now, we understand Gregor and his situation at the very beginning of this. We learn that he is going to happen to fall into an underland. We realize that he is introduced to these people who have lived their entire life plus generations before them in the underland. We understand that there's different cultures under the ground, the giant cockroaches, the rats, the bats, we've got the spinners. And then he mentioned some other kinds of beings that are down there that he couldn't recognize because he had no concept of it. That means scientists don't have that concept. And that means you're not going to find this kind of stuff in any books. But yet, are you also going to be able to find giant cockroaches that can talk? Are you going to find rats that can talk? Are you going to find that? Probably not in any science book. So we recognize that this is definitely fiction. We definitely recognize it's not realistic fiction. This is fantasy, right? This is a real world that doesn't really exist. But once you start digging into this, you start recognizing that it means more to you than you may have thought at the very beginning. So then you've got the climb, right? You've got this period of time where we're moving towards the big moment. Sometimes it kind of looks like this where you're kind of going up and something amazing happens and then you go to another step. But this entire story rests on the question, does Gregor find his father? Is there truly a prophecy? And will they get there? And at this point, we've come home. We've come home with dad, not home home, not New York City home, not up there, overland home. But we are talking about we have come back to regalia. We have returned from our adventure. And the whole place is ecstatic. But we also have some more questions right now. We have this wonder. What happened while we were gone? What are all the dead bodies all over the place about? And hopefully, we'll get some of those answers. The other thing that I'm going to let you know is, is that you know, because I've bragged about it, that this is a part of a five book series, right? There are five books to this, five books. And that means something has to happen at the end of this to make us want to read the next book, right? Gregor is not just going to wake up and go, oh, it was just a dream, right? That's not how you end a great story. So we are now into chapter 26 and we will find out what's up. Remember, as always, read the next or the last couple chapters or last couple paragraphs so you remember where we were yesterday. So this is what we ended with yesterday. Luxa, it's your grandpa, said Gregor. It seemed like the best and most important thing to say at the moment. It's your grandpa. Luxa blinked. A tiny tear formed at the corner of her eye. 
A battle took place on her face as she tried to stop the feelings rising up inside her. The feelings won, and to Gregor's great relief, she ran into Vicus's arms. That's where we ended, chapter 26. It was Sullivan Gregor ended up telling the story to. She appeared shortly after Vicus and, having kissed Lux's wet cheeks, embraced Gregor. If he was not concerned about his injuries, she was. She immediately led him down to the hospital section of the palace to be treated. While doctors cleaned and stitched his leg and tried to bring down the swelling in his nose, Gregor spilled out everything that had happened since they had parted. The journey through the rancid caves, the arrival of the spiders, Henry's attempt to kill Ripperet, Boots's fever, Tix's sacrifice at the bridge, finding his dad, and the strange series of events that had fulfilled Sandwich's prophecy. When he had finished, he felt like a balloon someone had let all the air out of. He just wanted to see his dad and Boots and then go to sleep. Solovit led him first to Boots, who was in a nursery with other sick kids. She had been bathed and changed, and while she was still warm to the touch, Dulcet promised him the illness was not serious. Cool. We cannot cure many things still, but we can cure this. It's just a case of damp fever, she said soothingly. Gregor smoothed back Boots' curls and went on to see his dad. His father already looked better. His face relaxed in sleep. The Underlanders had not only bathed him, but they'd groomed his hair and beard. The foul rat skins had been replaced by silken garments. They'd fed him and given him a calming medicine. And when he wakes, will he be okay? Asked Gregor. No one who spends years with the rats can expect to be unchanged, said Solovit gently. But will his mind and body heal? I believe it so. Gregor had to be satisfied with that. He himself would never be the same after what he had witnessed in the Underland. He had to expect some changes in his dad too. As he left the hospital, he heard a happy voice cry out, Overlander! Merith caught him up in a big bear hug. Gregor was glad to see Merith was alive, although he had injuries from recent battles. Hey, Merith, he said, how's it going? It goes darkly as it always goes in war, but you have brought back light to us, he said firmly. Oh yeah, said Gregor. He'd pretty much forgotten that part of the prophecy. An overland warrior, a son of the sun, may bring us back light. He may bring us back none. So he must have done it all after all, brought back light to the Underland. He wasn't really sure how, but if Merith said so, all the Underlanders must believe it so. What light, he asked. The images that filled his head were relentlessly dark. When news of King Gorger's death reached the rats, they fell into chaos. We have driven them far back into the dead land. Without a leader, they are in total disarray said Merith. Oh, good, said Gregor. I hope it lasts. Merith took him to his old room, the one he'd shared with Boots. He took a short bath just to lose the smell of rotten eggs that still clung to him from the dripping tunnel and fell into bed. When he awoke, he sensed that he had slept a long, long time. For the first minute or two, he lay in drowsy security, not remembering. Then all that had happened flashed before his eyes, and he couldn't stay in bed any longer. He looked he took a second bath and then ate the food that had appeared in his room while he was gone. Gregor was about to pause. How did they know he had gotten up? How fitting it is that he disappears, goes and takes a bath, and, oh, look, food's just waiting for me. Either somebody's been paying attention, or Suzanne Collins, you just kind of squeeze that in there to make sure that he got a little bit of food, right? Because remember, while they were on their adventure, they had very little food. They had very little water. They had very little resources and yet they still came together to kick butt. You know what I mean? Gregor was about to go to the hospital when Luxa ran into his room. Her eyes were red from crying, but she seemed her old self. Gregor, you must come. Hurry, she said, grabbing his arm and pulling him after her. His first thought was that there'd been attack on the palace, but that was not it. It's Ares. They mean to banish him, gasped Luxa as the two of them sprinted down the corridors. He did not know Gregor. He did not know of Henry's plot any more than I. I know he didn't, said Gregor. They burst into a room Gregor had not been to yet. It was like a small arena. Several hundred bats and humans sat on elevated bleachers that rose up around the central stage. In the front row sat members of the regalia council, including Vicus and Solovit. 
In the middle of the stage, alone and stooped, stood Ares. When Gregor and Luxa ran onto the stage, Aurora fluttered out of the bleachers to join them. Stop, yelled Gregor, trying to catch his breath. You can't do this. He didn't know all the ins and outs of banishment, but he did remember Luxa saying that no one survived living in the Underland alone for long. Maybe a rat like Rip Red could, but he was extraordinary under all circumstances. Everyone rose to their feet at Gregor's appearance and bowed in unison. Welcome, warrior, and many thanks for all you have brought us, said Vicus formally. But he also gave Gregor a sad smile that felt much more personal. Yeah, you're welcome, said Gregor. What are you doing to Ares? We are about to vote on his fate, said Vicus. There has been much debate about whether he was privy to Henry's plot. He wasn't, said Gregor. Of course he wasn't, or I wouldn't be standing here. He saved me, let Henry fall when he realized what was happening. He was bonded to Henry, said a large red bat. It's difficult to believe in his innocence. What of my innocence, said Luxa, her voice tight. No one was nearer to Henry than myself. Will you banish me as well? An uncomfortable murmur, 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 ran through the room. Everyone knew how close the cousins had been, and yet Luxa had been the target of Henry's treachery. Even if Ares is cleared on charges of treason, there is still the issue of his breaking of the bond said the red bat. That in itself is cause for banishment. Even when you find out you're bonded to a really evil guy, you can still be banished? Asked Gregor. Seems like there ought to be a special rule for that. Several members of the council began to dig through piles of old scrolls, as if hoping to find an answer to his question. But others were clearly after blood. Whether he is banished for treason or bond breakage, I care not. I just want him gone. Who among us could ever trust him again? Shouted a woman. There was an uproar in the arena. Ares seemed to hunch down even further, as if crushed by the weight of the anger that seemed to be against him. Gregor didn't know what to do. He couldn't stand by and watch them throw Ares out into the deadland to fend for himself. But how could he change their minds? The red bat echoed the last words Gregor had heard clearly. Yes, who among us could ever trust him again? I could, yelled Gregor, yes, silencing the crowd. I trust him with my life. And then he knew what he must do. He ran to Ares and extended his hand. The bat lifted his head in puzzlement, then understood. Oh no, Overlander, he whispered. I am not worthy to, risk, uh, to accept. Gregor reached out and grabbed the claw on Ares' left wing with his right hand. You could hear a pin drop in the room as he spoke these words. Ares the flyer. I bond to you. That was all he could remember of the pledge Luxa had told him, but she was right behind him, feeding him the words in a whisper. Our life and death are one. We are two. In dark, in flame, in war, in strife. And the last line came to Gregor without Luxa. I save you as I save my life. Some hope had come back into Ares. The warrior bonding with him was no guarantee he would escape banishment, but it was something that could not be easily ignored. Still, he hesitated. Say it, Gregor said softly. Please say it back. And Ares finally did, replacing his name with Gregor's own. Gregor the human, I bond to you. Our life and death are one, we too. In dark, in flame, in war, in strife, I save you as I save my life. Gregor stepped back to face the crowd. He and Ares stood before them, hands still locked to claw. Gregor spoke with a power that was entirely new to him. I am Gregor the Overlander. I am the warrior. I am he who was called. Who among you dares to banish Ares? My bond. <laughs> Oh, what a great way to end chapter 26. Oh my gosh. Are you sitting on the edge of your seat right now? Oh, me too. Oh my gosh. I'm dying right now. Chapter 27. There was anger and there was argument and a lot of talk about the law, but in the end, they couldn't banish Ares. The fact that Gregor bonded with the bat carried more weight than he had expected. One old man still dug furiously through his skulls until Vicus said to him, Oh, stop rattling your skins. We clearly have no precedent for this. 
Gregor turned to his new bat. Well, I probably won't be here much longer. It matters not, said Ares. While I have flight, I will be here always for you. As soon as things settled down, Gregor made a beeline for the hospital. He braced himself before entering his dad's room, fearing he might have relapsed. But when he went in, a happy scene awaited him. His dad was sitting up in bed laughing as Boots tried to feed him cookies. Hey, Dad, he said with a smile. Oh, Gregor, said his dad, beaming at him. His dad held out his arm, and Gregor rushed into them and held on so tightly. He could have stayed there forever, but Boots was tugging on them. No, Gigo, Dad, I eat cookie she said. The nurse told her to make me eat, and she takes her job very seriously, his father said with a smile. You feel okay? Asked Gregor, not letting go. Oh, a few square meals. I'll be as good as new, said his dad. They both knew it wasn't that simple. Life would never be the same, but they would have their life back, and they would have it together. Gregor spent the next few hours just hanging out with his dad, Boots, and Temp who came in to check on the princess. He wouldn't have asked his dad about his ordeal, but he seemed eager to talk. That night, the night I fell, I couldn't sleep. I went down to the laundry room to play a little saxophone. I didn't want to wake anybody. Well, from there too, oh, we fell from there too, said Gregor, through the air duct. Right, the metal grate just started banging up and down out of nowhere, said his dad. When I went over to check it out, I got stuck right down here. See, they had this strange phenomenon with the air currents. And his dad went on for 20 minutes about the scientific aspects of the currents. Gregor didn't know what he was talking about, but it was just great to hear his dad again. I was in Regalia for a couple of weeks and I was just going crazy missing you all. So one night I tried to escape with a couple of flashlights and a BB gun I found in the museum. Rats got me before I made it to the waterway, said his dad, shaking his head. How come they let you live? Asked Gregor. It wasn't me. It was the gun. After I ran out of ammo, they closed in on me. One of them asked about the gun, so I just started talking a blue streak about it. I convinced them I could make them. So they decided to keep me alive. I spent my time making weapons that I could use, but that fell apart when the rats touched them. A crossbow, a catapult, a battering ram. Lucky thing you showed up when you did. I think they were beginning to suspect. I was never going to make them anything that worked twice, said his dad. I don't know how you stood it, said Gregor. I just never stopped believing I'd get home again, said his dad. A cloud came over him, a darkness, and he had a lot of trouble getting to the next question. So how's mom? Probably not too good right now, said Gregor. But she'll be fine once we get you back. His dad nodded. And you, how are you? Gregor didn't talk about any of the bad stuff. Just the easy stuff. He told his dad about track and school and playing his saxophone at Carnegie Hall. He never mentioned spiders or rats or what he'd been through since his dad had disappeared. They spent the afternoon playing with boots, trying to make each other eat and often, without any particular reason, reaching out to touch each other. Just touch each other. Dulcet showed up eventually and insisted boots and his dad needed rest. So Gregor wandered off into the palace feeling happier than he had in two years, seven months, and he no longer cared about how many days. He was done with that rule now, for good. Even if times got bad, he would never again deny himself the possibility that the future might be happy, even if the present was painful. Boom. Do you hear the message? Do you hear it? That is one of the things that Miss Collins wants us to grab onto. That's one of those stories that he asks us or, or she asks us to pay attention to. Everything leads to that little message. He's been holding on to this problem for over two years, right? He's been waiting for life just to kind of get better. And he's been living in this kind of dark space. And now through his adventure, he learns, even if times got bad, he would never again deny himself the possibility that the future might be happy, even if the present was painful. He would allow himself to dream. As he was making his way back to his bed, he passed the room he'd been taken to as a prisoner the night that he'd tried to escape regalia. Vicus was sitting at the table alone, surrounded by piles of scrolls and maps. His face lit up when he saw Gregor and he waved him into the chamber. 
Come, come. Uh, we haven't spoken since your arrival, he said eagerly. How does your father be? Better, much better, said Gregor, sitting across from Vicus. And the princess, said Vicus with a smile. She's good. No more fever, said Gregor. For a minute, they just sat there, not sure where to begin. So, warrior, you leaped, <laughs> said Vicus. Yeah, I, I guess I did, said Gregor, grinning. Lucky Ares was there. Lucky for Ares, too, said Vicus. Lucky for us all. Know you the rats are in retreat? Merith told me, said Gregor. I believe the war will soon be at an end, said Vicus. The rats have begun to battle one another for their throne. What about Ripred? asked Gregor. I have heard from him. He is assembling a party of rats sympathetic to his cause in the Deadland. It will not be an easy task to take leadership of the rats. He must first convince them that peace is desirable, and that will be a long, long struggle. Still, he is not as easy an easy rat to ignore, said Vicus. I'll say, said Gregor. Even other rats are afraid to fight him. With good reason. No one can defend themselves against Rip Red, said Vicus. Ah, that reminds me. I have something for you. Several times on the journey, you made mention of your lack of a sword. The council asked me to present you with this. Vicus reached beneath the table and brought out a long object wrapped in very thick silk. Gregor unrolled it and found a stunningly beautiful sword studded with jewels. It belongs to Bartholomew of Sandwich himself. It is the wish of my people that you accept it, said Vicus. I can't take this, said Gregor. I, I mean, it's too much. And besides, my mom won't even let me have a pocket knife. This was true. On Gregor's 10th birthday, his uncle had sent him a pocket knife with 15 attachments, and his mom had put it away until he turned 21. I see, said Vikas. He was watching Gregor carefully. Perhaps if your father kept it for you, she would allow it? Maybe. But there's another thing, said Gregor. But he didn't know how to say the other thing, and it was the main reason he didn't want to touch the object in front of him. It had to do with Tick and Treflix and Gox, it had to do with all the creatures he'd seen lying motionless on his trip back to Regalia. It even had to do with Henry and the rats. Maybe he just wasn't smart enough. Maybe he just didn't understand. But it seemed to Gregor that there must have been some way to fix things so that everybody hadn't ended up dead. I pretend to be the warrior so I could get my dad. But I don't want to be a warrior, said Gregor. I want to be like you. I have fought in many battles, Gregor, said Vicus cautiously. I know, but you don't go looking for them. You try to work things out every other way you can. Think of first, even with the spiders and Rip Red, said Gregor. Even when people think you're wrong, you keep trying. Well then, Gregor, I know the gift I would wish you to give you, but you can only find it yourself, said Vicus. What is it? asked Gregor. Hope, said Vicus. There are times it will be very hard to find. Times when it will be much easier for you to chase hate instead. But if you want to find peace, you must first be able to hope it is possible. You don't think I can do that, said Gregor? On the contrary, I have great hope that you can, said Vicus with a smile. Gregor slid the sword back across the table to him. Tell them I said thanks, but no thanks. You cannot imagine how happy I am to deliver that message, said Greg Vicus. And now you must rest. You have a journey tomorrow. I do? Where? Not back to the Deadland, I hope, said Gregor, feeling a little ill. <laughs> no, I think it's time we send you home, said Vicus. They put a bed on in his dad's room that night so that he and Boots could sleep close by. Now that he was going home, Gregor began to let thoughts of Lizzie and his grandma and, most of all, his mom begin to come back into his head. They would still be okay when he got back. Would he, would they be, sorry, pause. Would they still be okay when he got back? He remembered his talk with Vicus and tried to hope for the best. Change, right? See how everything is laying out a little bit more on the positive side? Hope, right? No matter how bad things get, we wanna have hope that things are gonna be okay. That things should be okay. That things will be okay. As soon as his dad and Boots woke, they were taken to the dock where Gregor had made his escape the first night. 
a group of underlanders had assembled to see them off. Ares will take you to the portal above the waterway, said Vicus. You will be a short distance from there to your home. Merith pressed a handful of paper into his hands. He realized it was money. I took it from the museum. Vicus said you may need it to travel in the overland. Thanks, said Gregor. He wondered exactly where the waterway gateway was in relation to his apartment. He guessed he'd find out very soon. The way is safe now, but do not tarry. As you know, things can shift quickly in the underland, said Solovid. Gregor suddenly realized he would never see these people again. He was surprised by how much he would miss them. They'd been through a lot together. He hugged everybody goodbye. When he came to Luxa, he thought maybe he should just shake her hand, but he went ahead and hugged her anyway. She actually gave him a hug back. It was a little stiff, but then she was a queen. Well, so if you're ever in the Overland, you should drop by, <laughs> said Luxa, or said Gregor. Perhaps we, see, we shall see you here again someday, said Luxa. I don't know. My mom's probably going to ground me for the rest of my life just to keep me safe, said Gregor. What means this ground you, asked Luxa. Never let me leave the apartment. That is not what it says in the prophecy of Bane, said Luxa thoughtfully. What? What's that? asked Gregor, feeling a panic rise up in him. Did Vicus not tell you? It follows the prophecy of Grey, said Luxa. But I'm not in it, am I? I I'm not, right? Vicus? said Gregor. Ah, you must depart directly if you mean to catch the current, said Vicus, slipping the backpack and the uh, and boots onto his shoulders and leading him to Ares, who was already carrying his dad. What aren't you telling me? What's the prophecy of Bane? Insisted Gregor as he felt himself lifted onto Ares' back. Oh, that, said Vicus dismissively. That's very vague. No one has been able to explain that one for centuries. Fly you high, Gregor the Overlander. Vicus gave Ares a sign and he spread his wings. What is it, though? What does it say? Shouted Gregor as they rose off into the air. Bye-bye, Temp. See you soon, said Boots, waving cheerfully. No, Boots, no. We are not coming back, said Gregor. The last thing Gregor saw as they left the palace was Vicus waving. He was not sure, but he thought he heard the old man say, See you soon. Down the river he went, but this time he was flying over the foaming water on Ares' strong back. They soon reached the beach where he'd encountered Fangor and Shed. He caught a glimpse of the blackened ground where the fire had once been. Ten minutes later, the river fed into what was either a sea or the biggest lake Gregor had ever seen. Giant waves rolled across the water's surface and crashed onto rocky beaches. A pair of guards on bats appeared and escorted them over the water. Gregor didn't see any rats around, but who knew what else might be down here looking for a meal? He caught a glimpse of a 20-foot spiked tail as some creature flipped it out of the waves and then dove. Not even going to ask, he thought. The guards held their positions as Ares began to ascend into the vast stone cone. At the base, it may have been a couple of miles in diameter. A strange, misty wind seemed to be blowing them upward. Must be the currents, thought Gregor. Ares flew in tighter and tighter circles as they ascended. He had to close his wings to squeeze through the opening at the very top. Suddenly, they were zipping through tunnels that looked familiar. They were not built of stone, but of concrete. So Gregor knew that they must be almost home. The bat landed on a deserted stairway and nodded his head upwards. I can't go farther, said Ares. That is your way home. Fly you high, Gregor the Overlander. Fly you high, Ares, said Gregor. His hand wrapped tightly around Ares' claws for a brief moment. Then he let go. The bat vanished back down into the darkness. Gregor had to help his dad up a long flight of stairs. There was a stone slab in the ceiling at the top. When Gregor pushed it aside, a wave of fresh air hit his face. Oh my gosh, isn't that amazing that the wind just showed up like right at that moment? <clears throat> he pulled himself out and his fingers found grass. Oh, man, he said, hurrying up to help his dad out. Oh, man, look. Moon, said Boots happily, pointing into the sky. Yeah, moon, little girl. Look, Dad, it's the moon. His dad was too winded by the climb to answer. For a few minutes, they just sat in the grass, staring up at the beauty of a night sky. Gregor looked around and realized by the skyline that they were in Central Park. 
He could hear the traffic just beyond a row of, row of trees. He slid the stone slab back in place and helped his dad up. Come on, let's go get a cab. Let's go see Mama Boots, he asked. Yes, said Boots emphatically. Go see Mama. It must have been very late. Hardly anyone was out on the streets, but a few restaurants were still open. It was just as well since they made a funny sight, all dressed in their underland clothes. Gregor flagged down a cab and they piled into the back seat. The driver either didn't notice or didn't care how they looked. He probably had seen everything. Gregor pressed his face against the window, drinking in the buildings, the cars, and the lights. All those beautiful lights, it seemed to take no time at all to reach their apartment. He paid the driver and added a huge tip. When they came to the front door, his dad pulled out his keychain, the one Gregor had made him from his pocket. He fanned out the keys with trembling fingers and found the right one. For once, the elevator wasn't broken, and they rode up to Gregor's hall. They opened the apartment door softly, not wanting to wake anyone. Gregor could see Lizzie asleep on the couch. From the bedroom, he could hear his grandma murmuring in her sleep. So she was all right. A light was on in the kitchen. His mother sat at the kitchen table as still as a statue. Her hands were clasped together, and she stared fixedly at a small stain on the tablecloth. Gregor remembered seeing her that way so many nights after his dad had disappeared. He didn't know what to say. He didn't want to scare her or shock her or even give her any more pain. So he stepped into the light of the kitchen and said one thing that he knew she wanted to hear most in the world. Hey, Mom, we're home. Welcome to the end of Gregor the Overlander. Hey, Mom. We're home. Oh! Can you imagine what his mom must have felt like when he arrived? Can you imagine what she must have thought when she saw Boots again? And can you imagine the fact that they entered the house with Dad? Dad was home. Dad was safe. He'd be there. Hope is there. And you got to imagine that right after that, Mama must have freaked out. Then Lizzie would have come in and Grandma might have shuffled on in after that. The family was together again. That is a great resolution to a great st story. And did you hear? Did you hear how the little seed was dropped? The prophecy of Bane. Now, I don't want to freak you out anymore, but this is the deal. You know darn well that my deal is that I only read the first book of any series. The reason why is I want you, if you love this book, if you love this series, if you like these kinds of books, then I want you to hunger to go and find it again. Remember, the author's name is Suzanne Collins, and you know how much I love to look at pictures, especially at the end. Can you figure out where this is? I can. You get to see the bats. But do you remember this? You remember me talking about the natural bridge? That's the natural bridge. That's where we are. I love the idea of the light above. I have no idea where that light's coming from because reality is, is they had no light down there. All they had were the light, the headlamps, right? But the fact is, is that this is the other part that you got to see. There is the list of books and let me make sure that you understand that book number two is Gregor the Overlander and the Prophecy of Bane. You heard them talk about it. And the last thing that Vika said was, see you soon, Overlander. So if you want it, you got it, man. You got four more books that you can do. If you felt like this is where you're rolling, roll into book number two. Oh my gosh. So great. The third book is called the Curse of the Warm Bloods. The fourth book is called Gregor and the Marks of Secret. And finally, Gregor and the Code of the Claw. Oh, I know bits and pieces of all those things. Warm Bloods have to be the humans, have to be the ones that are not insects, right? But the Code of the Claw you know what those claws are. We kept hearing about those claws. Now, there are two animals that we know of. Who are the two? 
We've got the rats who have claws that climbed up the wall. And what was it that Gregor grabbed onto when he promised Ares his life? The claw, right? So I have no idea what the code really is. But the prophecy of Bane awaits you. Oh, so here's the deal. You've got another great series in your back pocket if you so choose to grab onto it. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to roll. I don't know where we're headed next. I think maybe for a little while, I might be jumping in and having a little bit of fun with a few more of the Blackfeet stories because I'm kind of interested in finding out what's going on with that. So we'll finish this week off with some, some Blackfeet stories. And next week, who knows? If you're interested, you're more than welcome to send me some wish lists. I've got some folks who have been writing me some ideas, but shoot, I'm totally open. If you've got a great book, if you've got a great series, if you've got something that great readers have to read because you just have not been able to let this one off, send me a note. But until we meet again, thank you. Congratulations on finishing another book because it feels so good. I love you very much. You know that. Today is the only today that you've got, and I hope you make it the very best possible today that you can. I love you, and most importantly, get out of here and go find your own book to read.